brought my son to uh, McDonald. The two guys next table talking about the quantum mechanics. <laughs> and uh, so it was fantastic. You should come to Boulder. The US Marine and Notre Dame and the NASA. Which job did you like best? Oh, of course this one. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, Don. <laughs> I would like to hear some fun, interesting stories of yours because you guys are working really interesting places like NASA and NCAR. You know, someone like me can never ever imagine to work. So some really unexpected stories you probably have, I guess. So any fun story, Dr. Pan? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> It's a tough question. On the spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll just talk about it at the, the beginning years uh, when I started to research flight. You know, you always have a little bit of concern of how you might run into weather and the safety and so on. There are times when the weather, you know, the convection, what we have convection, just, you know, storm cells can really bring surprises when you're sitting on a research aircraft. My, uh, when I started, I have a mentor. He used to tell me, I said, what happened if we got run into the convection? He said, oh, no problem. Your laptop will just fly to the ceiling. You just capture it. <laughs> so then later on, that I had that type of experience. And I find that very, um, in some ways, liberating. You know, because you used to have a fear. You know, I you know, I remember my first research flight. There was a young woman get on the flight and I was telling people on the ground, tell my mom if I don't come back. You know, <laughs> so very much feared of research flight. And usually, once you have that kind of experience, you always get a fantastic data. You know, so afterward, the publications, that's the highlight. <laughs> I see. But yeah. before you got into the flight, <laughs> it's kind of a scary feeling. But after you see the all the, getting the, all the data and the writing the research paper, that's a scene. Yeah, once you have, once the, I also had a chance to grab my laptop. That's on, on a different flight. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the person like me just, you know, working at the desk and uh, meeting other people, and that was probably it. But it seems like a very new word. I don't know, the fantastic thing to experience to me. Yeah, it, it's a very um, challenging and a rewarding career. I was working in Boulder, Colorado. I just been into Denver, and I thought it's a fascinating place. I've never been to Boulder. So I was working there. Come to Boulder next time. <laughs> you know, in Boulder, usually we say Boulder has highest concentration of PhDs <laughs> because we have a number of research labs and the university and so my very first visit to Boulder I moved with my husband at doing house hunting and brought my son to uh, McDonald and uh, the two guys next table talking about quantum mechanics <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so it was fantastic you should come to Boulder I don't know if I can pass <laughs> to get living there <laughs> well I actually uh, saw the clip that you were being interviewed it was uh, 2017 and you were the one of the pilots um, who took her uh, the picture yep system operator I operated the right. camera right yeah. total eclipse of sun that's correct how was the experience that was an experience of a lifetime it was indescribable we I had No, I didn't have a lot of time to actually enjoy it because I was doing a lot of work. Uh, yeah, we, we, that's what you said in the interview. <laughs> we, use, we use the same camera that, we, that I was speaking of earlier that does the re-entries for uh, the observation, slightly modified with some, some lenses. Mm -hmm. But um, as soon as we were in the shadow, uh, I was very busy trying to make sure that all of the systems were running correctly. And uh, I didn't get a chance to really look at it, unfortunately. But I had lots of cameras running and was able to yeah. look at it before and after, and it was It was so amazing being in daylight and then darkness so immediately. And then back to daylight as soon as I was done with my work. How long was that? Uh, it was about four minutes. So um, we actually flew two of our WB-57s far enough apart that as the shadow came off the first one, it, mm -hmm. it was on the second one. So we had eight minutes of uninterrupted observation. Ah, I see. Yeah, by the way, the ground station scientist, he was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, he was. <laughs> yeah, with your sacrifice. <laughs> uh, that would be it. I think that's, my, that's the highlight of, uh, of, of, of all my science years. You served the U.S. Marine. I did. Wow. And then you moved on to um, Northrop Grumman? Northrop Grumman uh, as an electrical engineer. I worked there for, uh, for a number of years uh, and was able to come on to NASA and And, wow, uh, the fascinating career, the U.S. Marine and Northrop Grumman and the NASA. Which job did you like best? 
<laughs> well, of course, this one. <laughs> Good answer, Don. <laughs> this is by far the, the best out of all of them. Got to travel around the world and work with very interesting and, and smart people. I just some of the smartest people in the world. And it's been very fulfilling. And Dr. Yuma, you were working at the Calder Center. Yes. It's a world famous one. Just outside of Washington, DC. There are 10,000 people who work at Goddard. Wow. So it's a very big center, all dedicated to satellite observations. We have a backup copy of what's called the Vanguard 2 satellite, which was one of the earliest meteorological satellite ever launched. But uh, we've got it hanging from the ceiling in, in, our, in our building. Um, and so you see this long uh, history of satellite observations. You go to Goddard and you can walk over and, and watch the actual satellite operations rooms. So every different satellite has a different operations room. Um, so you can see, and there's lots of satellites. It's amazing how many are up flying. And as Don mentioned, you know, one of the, I think the most, the best thing about working at NASA is working with the people. It's Every day somebody walks into your office and says, hey, I'm thinking about this. And they'll tell you something that's really interesting or a new idea to make a measurement. And it's just, it's just fun. I mean, every day, of course, you're always working on spreadsheets and doing budgets and other dumb stuff like the bureaucracy, which is not that fun. But you always have the sort of the enjoyment of somebody telling you something really interesting. And that is the, the great thing about working at NASA is somebody comes up with a new idea to do something really interesting and fun or cool or necessary. Actually, I think that's, we scientists, we approach this from it's fun, it's interesting, it's cool. But a lot of times it's really important and you don't really think so much about the importance as a scientist. You think about how interesting and fun it is. Um, that's the great thing about working at NASA. That's why I really like it. I mean, it is um, named after Robert Goddard, yes. who was a very famous... Robert Goddard developed, uh, was a, the, the developer of rockets. I think if you look back 100 years ago, in the 1920s, the idea of launching things into orbit was inconceivable. People just didn't think about that. There you know, maybe some funny movies about it, but people just didn't really think about what we could do from space. But now you see it every day. Every day people pull out their, either, you know, their iPhones or whatever and they look at the weather and they don't realize that all a huge amount of the information to do our weather comes from those satellites. So the world is a, is a really much better place today because of rockets and satellites. And that all starts with things like making ground measurements, scientists analyzing the data, coming up with new ways of making measurements of temperature and humidity. That's the really great thing. And here in Korea too, there's a lot of great scientists doing the same sort of things that we do at NASA. Yeah, because I was amazed to read a story of the, uh, Robert Goddard. That he was thinking about 1929 or something, I remember. And then there was one guy who believed in him, who was Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> yeah, who is, you probably know about him. Yeah, who is the first aviator who crossed the, the Atlantic Ocean, right? And then there's just really, really few number of people who believed in him, believed in his dream, and shared his dream. And that's actually the driving force that led us to reach here, arrive here. It's a bunch of satellites. Maybe they're watching us, but <laughs> they let us know what kind of weather we're going to have uh, tomorrow and also GPS and everything. That's a huge lift for the humankind. That's really amazing. So Pe People no longer use paper maps. Right. They have their phones. <laughs> and their phones tell them where to go. <laughs> and my son was asking me, so before the iPhone and before the, the, the smartphones and navigation system, the how did you find the places? Read the map. <laughs> well, you were this much close to go to the space, right? No, it's uh, it's quite a bit further. Uh, just because <laughs> I'm at the much. top of the atmosphere doesn't mean that I'm I'm in low Earth orbit. Uh, it's, there's uh, quite a bit between uh, between where we would fly in the space station, but um, for the most part, no other people there. Right. So probably can have some new take or perspective. You know, going up that high mm -hmm. probably give us some new thought about your life and Earth and, I don't know, some philosophical thing. Yes, I, and I remember my first uh, set of high flights where I was doing my training and looking down and seeing, you know, hundreds of miles in each direction and thinking to myself, there, there are so many people down there with their own individual lives living the way that they, that they do and, and it's, 
it's uh, it's humbling. It, it really makes you think about how you can help better the cause of humanity. Yeah, because it's very. It should be very quiet and dark. Well, there's the jet engines. So. Yeah, ah, I see. <laughs> it's not very quiet, okay, but it it's gets not pretty that quiet. dark. And Dr. Yuma, you are an award-winning scientist. So you actually um, got another award this year as well. So as a prominent and as a very well-known and award-winning scientist, is there any word that you would like to tell the Korean people, and not just the Korean people, maybe to the future generation, I would say? I will tell us a story from when I was a young scientist. This is, goes back to 1987. And in 1987, we didn't know what caused the ozone hole. I will admit, you know, I had uh, three daughters, young daughters at the time, and I worried about the world a lot. I worried about what was causing the ozone hole. I didn't know that it was due to human produced compounds, but I thought it was. And I thought to myself, What's, what will happen to this planet? This earth, you know, we all live in this very thin layer that surrounds this big rock, you know, and, and ball. I must admit that I had sleepless nights thinking about what was happening in our atmosphere. Were we the cause of it? And what was going to happen in the future? And now I reflect back and I think, okay, the ozone hole was discovered in 1985. In 1987, we figured out what was causing it, and it was human-produced compounds. The Montreal Protocol was signed in 1987. We went up to the Arctic. We found out that maybe there could be ozone holes in the Arctic if we did nothing. And the nations of the world actually signed on to the Montreal Protocol. They strengthened the Montreal Protocol. They added amendments to it. And in the mid-90s, we began to see the ozone-depleting substances, they stopped growing. And through the 90s, we've seen them go down. New technologies were discovered to replace the compounds that we were using. And so looking back in, in 2021 here, and looking back at what I was thinking in 1987, I've kind of become an optimist. I believe that one, we can figure out what's happening to the atmosphere. Two, political policymakers and industry in various organizations can act together to solve the problem. And we, as a modern society, can figure out how to find replacements. I, I still worry. I still have sleepless nights about things like climate change and what it means for my daughters, my granddaughters, my great grandkids. But I'm a little bit of an optimist now. I went from being a bad pessimist in 1987, and I think in time, I become an optimist. And I think that is, and, and I've had a unique position to sit at NASA and to see the details of all of this happening. Most people don't see it. They, they don't know that all of this has occurred, but I, I've seen it um, with my own eyes and I've become an optimist about it. So I have a lot of faith that people will, it, it may take them time, but eventually they do the right thing. And I think people should be optimistic about the future. But of course, you have to make the decisions to do the right thing. It's been a really interesting conversation. Uh, well, to tell the truth, I almost failed in physics when I was a high school student. <laughs> so I was, a little bit, um, I was a little bit scared to have this conversation with you guys. So, oh, wow, this is the time, I mean, the, the moment of truth, that how ignorant I am to all people. But it was really fascinating stories that we shared, and I believe our audiences will enjoy it tremendously. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for inviting you. us, and thank you to the, the, the people of Korea for hosting us. Thank you.